today. We worked real hard at practice and it paid off. Uh, uh, did you have any uh, in your wildest dreams you'd win by 46 points today? We knew that we could do the job we successfully and, and we did it. All right, uh, thinking ahead of next week, Eric, your thoughts going into the big one? Well, I'm looking forward to it because we lost last year and I'm just looking forward to it. Eric, great season and good Eric luck next Hunter. week. All right, Eric Hunter. Eric had uh, five out of eight pass completions for 104 yards. Yards rushing, 144 to 86. Passing yards, 209 yards. And there's yards. Dwayne Murphy right in the middle at number 43. Got two minutes, A.G. 29 yards past shot of him walking out onto the field, and uh, we'll be able to hear the mic. Hopefully, it'll be better than the reception you're getting at the moment. Captain Todd, said, I reckon you'll be Captain Wilson, Captain Hunter. Uh, the officials for you today. I said, I'm Mr. McCool, Mr. Nick McCool, your referee. I got Mr. Clemensic as my umpire, Mr. Chisman as my linesman, Mr. Sparrow as back judge, and Mr. Roby is my line judge. Okay, let's go into the coin toss. Uh, we've had a fiber prior to the. Uh, to right now, and Hampton has won the toss and deferred to the second half. So let me tell the stands. Hampton won the toss. I'm at the bottom of your screen. Hunter fakes and will throw. Has plenty of time. Throws for Monday down the sidelines. stats here as you look try to get Eric oh uh, yeah try to get Eric Hunter and maybe Tony Hyman yeah. we got about three minutes worth of tape left in fact I guess we could probably go to a tape change if we need to there you see the Eastern Regional Trophy something that's and it's still first down but it's first down and 18 as the holding call was assessed from the point of the infraction in the end zone Hyman's open touchdown Tim there is no Here's the Hampton players are Kenny Owens, number two, Eric Hunter, number nine, and number 75, excuse me, is James Wilson for first goal. This turnover. Two fumbles and an interception. Hunter again gets pressure. He's got a lot of running room. The big six foot five inch senior is taken down at the 24 yard line. A big first down for the Crabbers. And Tim, that was just like a quarter. Absolutely not at this not. point in not, the season. Not the 11th game of your season. Not when you're 10 and 0. Hunter wants to pass. He gets it away, and it's caught at the 20. Play this year, and I have absolutely nothing but uh, congratulations for that. Okay, back to the live action. 44 seconds. Hunter wants to pass. Throws downfield for. Is that Monday? see the replay again. The Murphy's run. Now this is the one that's set up. This is that 30 yard run uh, earlier. Eric Hunter. Uh, getting back to what I was going well, to do. Get something in the end zone. And uh, here's a good shot of Eric Hunter, Tim. He has been all everything as far as the Hampton fans are concerned and the Peninsula District. That is the end of the third quarter. And our score after three quarters of play from Todd Stadium, the Hampton Crabbers, 26. The Thank you.
Eric Hunter was born to the late Edgar Wardrell Hunter Jr. and the late Teresa Irene Walker. Eric grew up in the housing projects of Sweetbriar in Brittany and Hampton, Virginia, along with his sister Yvonne and Felicia Hunter. Okay, uh, this is in reference to uh, Eric Hunter. Um, I played with Eric Hunter. Uh, the, uh, my senior year was 1986-87 uh, uh, season. Um, we ended up winning the state championship, and I think uh, subsequently, after I graduated, he won um, another one. Um, but uh, Eric was a quarterback as, as well as I played quarterback, so him and I, we spent a lot of time together on the field. Um, we would throw together. Um, we would uh, go back and assess plays together. One thing about Eric, he was an exceptional athlete. Had a cannon for arm. Um, he was fast. Um, he was tall. He was strong. Um, and he was a competitor. Um, I know uh, <laughs> a couple of times when, when, when he first came out there, you know, he was a real, real skinny, scrawny kid, but he was tall and lanky. Um, uh, the mindset of uh, 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 Randall Cunningham at the time, he had a, uh, a, a long throwing motion, but um, he, would, he would get it there and it would, with such velocity. Um, it, it got to the point where after he started, you know, realizing his strength and throwing the ball, I, I wouldn't catch with him anymore. Um, my, my, hands, my hands would hurt, so um, I couldn't do that. Um, to be honest with you, I, I really thought that at that time, you know, Eric was, was probably was going to take my position, but he was still coming up from JV, and uh, although I had been there a couple of years, so I had a little bit more experience, so um, uh, thank goodness for that. Um, but he ended up having a successful, um, tremendous career at Hampton High School, um, and then, you know, leaving Hampton High and then going on to doing greater things in college. Um, I, I will say, you know, the latter part of when... Um, Eric came home. Um, I would see him time to time, and we would talk. He always kept to himself when he came home. Um, but um, uh, pretty much other than that, you know, high school was was such a great time um, for me. Just experiencing, you know, his his talent and his level of uh, just uh, competitiveness. Um, him and I would play, you know, quarterback games. Um, and, and I used to find myself trying to, you know, keep tallies of when I beat them because it was few and far between. We would we would play, you know, quarterback games and see who could, you know, hit the corner of the pylon. We run a seven route and who would, would place it there or, or who had the the, the best, um, you know, spiral um, doing practices. So him and I would just compete, you know, um, along those lines. He was a great competitor as, as well as I. So, um, you know, that right there, um, you know, took it to, you know, another level. I will say um, Eric was a great friend. Um, he had some, some guys that he hung out with, you know, during uh, those times. Uh, you, would, you would come up and you would hang out with your class. You know, you played rec league together. All those guys came up from rec league, and then you played JV, and then you played varsity. So him um, and his teammates and, and our teammates and, and his class, they hung together um, real tough. And that right there was the camaraderie that, you know, Hampton High would always have. And that's why we, we, we became, you know, legendary, you know, here in the city of Hampton um, with, uh, you know, winning state championships. I will say, you know, he, he blossomed into a leader. Um, and he led by way of example on the field. He would leave everything on the field. If it was something that needs to be done, he would do it. Um, he would want to play every position on the field, too. Um, <laughs> it was cornerback safety, but, but coach, wouldn't, coach wouldn't let him play. He would, he would always leave him at um, quarterback. Um, it was just some fun times with that guy. Um, uh, he, he, he is missed. Um, he will be missed. And I will say he is a legend at Hampton High. I, I will say, you know, Hampton High has had some great quarterbacks come through. Marcus Hagan, Tyrod Taylor, Ron Curry. Um, just to name, you know, a few. You have, you know, Marco Stacy. Um, uh, a, a lot of great quarterbacks have come through. Just a lot of great players. But I will say, you know, Eric in, in my era and, and what I've seen. And I've been, you know, at Hampton High through since the 70s when my sisters and my um, 
you know, my sisters uh, went to um, Hampton High School, going to the games in the early 70s and seeing Hampton High, just coming up, you know, with that, um, wanting to play for Hampton High. I will say that, you know, personally for me, um, he is one of the greatest quarterbacks to ever play at Hampton High School, my opinion. Yeah, um, friend of um, Eric Hunters. My name is Todd Summers. I uh, grew up with Rick. We call him Rick. Um, I grew up with him from childhood. I would say um, second grade on. I met Rick lived in the neighborhood around my grandmother. Um, we started off playing baseball in the same uh, baseball league, Mallory, um, Little League Baseball. And Rick always been a Nice size kid. Um, grew up to be 6'5, pretty big, and um, always pretty aggressive, I would say. He liked to win, you know what I mean? Um, but Rick was, Rick was serious about winning. You know, I lived in the neighborhood, we lived in the same neighborhood together, same apartment complex together when we was teenagers, um, early teens, probably 10, 11. 12, 13 years old, around the age, 13, 14. And um, even back then, Rick uh, wanted to win so much that uh, we used to play football every day when we came home from school or on the weekends. Um, we played, we'd play tag football in the street, sometimes in the field, in the back of the apartments we would play. But Rick always wanted to be the all-time quarterback. I mean, and, and if he couldn't be the all-time quarterback, he would take the ball, want to fight, you know what I mean? But he wanted to be the all-time quarterback, so a lot of times we pretty much ain't want to go through the stuff we're going to have to go through with Rick. You know what I mean? So we'll go ahead and let him be the all-time quarterback. You know, even if he come out there late and we already playing, we'll go ahead and let him be the all-time quarterback. And you know, he, he threw that ball. You know, um, coming up with Rick, playing high school football with him, um, playing a little, little league baseball with him. He always had a, a great arm. I mean, I don't even know what you call it. Bazooka. Rifle. That joke was stronger than a rifle, though. Um, I coached Ronald Curry, coached Tyrod. Um, them guys that had an arm that Ronald, that um, Eric Hunter had. They had nowhere near the arm he had. That joke would hold the ball, put the thumbprint in the ball. He threw it. He was, he was accurate. He, he, he could throw it in there nice and hard. And I think early on, he used to throw all his balls up in there nice and hard before he learned how to put a um, little touch on it. You know, I throw a pass, whether it's just throw the ball. He used to gun everything in there. But Rick, Rick was a great athlete. And um, he was a good guy. Um, he was a good guy, great athlete. I just wish sometimes he didn't go to Purdue. You know, because I felt like um, going up there to Purdue by itself. And I just think that Purdue wasn't pretty much. I think the coaching staff that wanted him there at first, I think they had a coach out there, Coach Jackson, that wanted him there at first. I think they were pretty, they was pretty good and, and took care of him. But that first staff left. And, uh, he really didn't get along with that second staff. And I, I talked to him several times about that. And, um, he didn't really get along with the new coaches that came in. And um, you know, he went through a lot of stuff with them. And I think he told me about the time he had hurt his arm when he was like a senior or going into his senior year and they wanted him to sit out or whatever, but he wanted to keep playing. They ended up playing him, but for some reason he didn't get along with that, the new coaching staff he had. Um, there's a lot I can say about Rick, but I don't know really what you know, what to really what to talk about with him. I just wish that uh, whatever he went through um, at the end of his time at Purdue, I just wish that he had somebody there to go through it with him. Or, you know, I think it's sad what he went through. He was a great guy. I just think he was left out on the island with nobody to walk with him. And then he probably had a mindset coming from here 
I was a little different than a lot of places. You know, his background. And Rick was a, he was a beast. You know, we was, we was taught coming up in high school to be beast masters. And he was a beast, without question. He was a beast. He didn't mind running the ball. Um, Rick didn't mind hitting. Um, I think Rick pretty much would have been our starting safety if, if, um, if the coach, coach, I think Coach Smith thought he was going to kill himself if he, if he stayed at safety. So I think he just made him play, just let him play quarterback and uh, kept him off the defensive side of the ball because Rick would try to run through you. So I, I you know, I just, I, I wish y'all could see some film of him, see him play a little bit. He's a great, great athlete, great athlete, great guy too, great guy. Okay. Here we have Tony Hyman, former Hampton High alum and teammate of Eric Hunter. I know we have a limited amount of time, so let's get right into it. Sure. Who was Eric Hunter? Man, Eric was a, was a great leader, probably one of the, the, the greatest quarterback that's ever come out of the Peninsula District. Uh, at the time when we played in the, in the late 80s, uh, he was a prototypical type quarterback, had the, the height and the size to, to match it, had the arms, could make every throw. Um, Eric was a great leader, uh, a great uh, teammate, uh, you know, just a really good guy. Um, and uh, he led us to, you know, two state championships during, you know, during our tenure there. When did you first meet Eric? So I first met Eric uh, in the ninth grade. Uh, we, uh, we went out for uh, JV and, and we played JV ball together and, you know, we both made varsity our sophomore year and we would go down and play uh, on Saturdays and play JV football together. And uh, so probably, you know, our freshman, sophomore year is, is, is the first time that, that, uh, that, that I met him. Talk to me about Eric's leadership. So Eric was a, was a great leader on the football field. Um, you know, Eric was ferocious on the football field. Even as, a, even as a quarterback, he played much like a linebacker played. You know, he was a mean dude on, on the field. But, I mean, when you're talking about keeping your teammates accountable, um, holding us accountable and, um, and being where you're supposed to be, practicing hard, playing hard. Uh, he was one of the, the best leaders that we had on our team. Can you think back to your favorite game with Eric? So, you know, Eric and our relationship, uh, Kanda is one of those relationships where without the other, you know, we don't have the production uh, individually. And so, you know, I owe a lot of my success on the football field to Eric and probably a lot of my success of being able to earn a scholarship to go to Howard University to, to Eric. Um, Eric and I had plenty of games that, um, that, that we deal, did well together, but probably two games that sticks out in my mind is uh, our senior year we played Warwick High School. Um, you know, I had 10 catches in that game for about 180 yards and three touchdowns. And then in our playoff game, uh, my senior year against uh, First Colonial, um, I had four catches for about 200 and something yards and three touchdowns. And uh, we really dominated those games. And um, I think, you know, during those games is when, you know, him and I really became, um, there used to be a, a, a cheerleader who would draw this, um, this cheer up every, before every game. And it would be a picture of him and he wore number nine and I wore number one, and she would draw two football players and draw the number nine and then draw the number one on the other one, and she would say a perfect 10. And, um, and so, uh, you know, Eric and I on the football field, uh, you know, was, and there were games when we were perfect. Talk to me a little bit about mental health. So, you know, mental health issues is, is, is especially big today with, you know, so many, uh, so many people coming out now with these with mental health issues and you know it's always been there i think the problem has been is that in our community um, our kids are never diagnosed with mental health and you know if, whether it's from our economic backgrounds that we come from where either we don't uh, go to doctors or um, psychologists and
Um, he was, uh, you know, six four, uh, long, athletic. Uh, prior to me actually meeting him, he had come on a visit. Well, that was the first meeting. He came on a recruiting visit, and uh, you know, he just was energetic, man. Long. He, you know, he he looks like he looked like a prototypical uh, uh, NFL quarterback at that time. Uh, I would say around, man, maybe 2000, 2001, you know, because you, 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 you run into guys and then you talk or you talk to guys and then you start talking about guys and you're like, Hey, whatever happened to this guy, this guy. And then, you know, that's probably one of the first times when I, you know, talked to one of the uh, fellow uh, former football players and we got to talking about people and, uh, you know, they had told me about some incidents that happened uh, probably the year after I left and, uh, you know, he had gotten in some trouble, uh, some um, allegations or some things that happened with a young lady. So that's probably the first time I heard about, you know, some of the things that was probably going on in his life or had gone on in his life. Um, I didn't really hear about how he was doing at the present moment. Everybody, he had kind of fell in, fallen out of contact with everybody. I think and, mental health is extremely important. Um, I believe most things start in your mind. So if you're not healthy upstairs, it's going to come out uh, in the physical as well. So what you're showing upstairs will eventually come out in the physical if you're not healthy. Or did mental health in today's society, in your opinion? Very important. I think a lot of people don't have a good understanding of mental health. I think it is a problem now that kids need to be checked out early at a young age if they have a problem and got to seek help. People don't understand what they're seeking help. There's something that a coach can't do. Uh, I mean, you got to be a skilled person, a professional, look at a kid, mental health side. Got you. That's, 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 you really touched it right on, right on the head. Uh, that's definitely important. And to, even, and to elaborate on that even more, a lot of times kids... Uh, go through programs because they're gifted and they just get pushed along because at some point either the parents or in some cases even the coaches just the community in general feel they're going to be a pro athlete so it's not really as important to deal with that issue right now because they see the, the, the more of the pro side of they don't really see the downfall if the mental health is not taken care of especially when it's, uh, when it's young and when it's definitely young. Uh, okay, well, good. So second question. Now, as a coach and a mentor, how do you approach athletes who might have a great opportunity to make it pro but might show signs of mental illness, say such as a bipolar or something like that? How do you approach that? You see an issue, but you know that, that, that young woman, young man has an opportunity to go pro. How do you approach them, you know, as far as their mental health is concerned, but you know they have a great opportunity to go pro as an athlete. I think that sometimes you got to talk to the parents or the legal guardian. Sometimes people have to see psychologists, a psychological help from a professional doctor. And they really think the younger you get it, the better. And it was the first problem you have again is the parent and the kids seeing that they need help. Right. Because you can't help the body unless they think they need help. True indeed. Okay, well, great. Well, you answered those two questions right, right on the head. Um, now, in your experience, without naming names, of course, has there ever been a time where you thought a kid uh, has potential to make it pro, but needed their 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 athletics was there, but the men the the mentals was kind of slipping, and you kind of saw from a distance, hey. Maybe by talking to a parent or the guardian that maybe they need to get some other things checked out, you know, before they move forward. Because as, as we talked about earlier, that's something that you want to catch early because you don't want to wait till they get to a professional level. And then they've been dealing with a mental illness say, for the last 10 or, 10 or 20 years. And they finally get to a point where it's, it's kind of almost too late. I think the, I think the biggest problem you have people recognize that you have a problem. And then it's really too late, because now the NBA look at how psychological tests they do with the kids now. They ask the background. 
And the biggest problem is just people don't realize they won't help. And you got to convince them it's important to have, getting help and seeking help. And it's not a shame. Back when I first started, it was a shame to have a mental problem. Now, mm -hmm. now if you can get a kid a bipolar problem early enough, and understand the symptoms. Me as a coach don't have a great understanding, but you get professional, they can do it a lot better than what we can do. That's very, that's, that's very true. And, um, and not to even stereotype it, but a lot of times, especially, unfortunately, uh, in, um, in the black community, we as, uh, we don't, like you said, it's looked at as, as frowned upon. You're right. More right. so than, than looked at as, okay, well, <coughs> You know, we we can we can look at this from a religious standpoint, or we can look at it from a, a psychological standpoint. And unfortunately, in a lot of and, and uh, fortunately, unfortunately, in a, in a black community, a lot of times we come from deprived situations. We don't really have the resources to may talk to a doctor. And come from certain communities, if we are that one child in our family who has the opportunity probably to make it pro, we kind of push it aside because we don't want to. We don't want to, that to be a stigma going forward, and that may hurt our chances of making it pro because you might have a team that said, well, well you want to draft you, but we don't know what your mind going to be like five years from now. And they don't take that risk on you, so we kind of push it aside because as a society, we don't have the resources, unlike maybe other groups that may have the resources to be able to take care of these things at a young age. I find it very interesting um, you being who you are in your position for so many years, since 1982, you have, you know, coached some of the greats, the Allen Iversons, the Lonzo Mornings, the Joe Smiths, a lot of these guys made it pro. All of them made it pro and had a great impact, not just in the Hampton, Virginia area, but around the world in general. You played such a big part in that. Uh, could you tell me a little bit about how you as a coach and a mentor and a father figure to a lot of us, how did you deal with situations with, with, with athletes um, where they may have been going through some things, but, you know, to them, you was more than just a coach. You, you was more than just Coach Boo Williams. You were like a father figure. How did you take them in and coach them along to um, make sure they made it pro and kept and kept their mind right at the same time? I think sometimes coaches got to understand the relationship is very important. I think it's not about winning and losing a basketball game. It's about the game of life. And it's not time coaches are understanding it. Older coaches do, and then we gotta get the younger coaches to understand it's about the game of life. It's not about what you do for a player now, or what you do for a player in his lifetime. And so, and, and, and like I said, back in the, I like to say old days, <laughs> yeah. people, people didn't understand mental health problems. They didn't understand the mental problems that kids go through, or being a bipolar, or psychological problems that a kid would go through, or what the kid is dealing with. They just said the kid is crazy and keep going on, but uh, they didn't help. And, yeah. uh, and like I said, we keep saying, the earlier you can solve the problem, the better you can solve the problem. But once you get too late, it's too late. It's going to be much more difficult to solve the problem. That's true. I, I, I agree with you 100%, uh, especially, you know, with the way society is now, with, with social media, things spread so quickly. You, you do one thing on the internet, that's quote unquote crazy, the whole world will know about it. Yeah, know about it quickly. <laughs> exactly, five minutes later. You could, you, could have, you could be the best dunk in the world, but if you lose your mind and, 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 and chase somebody around the neighborhood with a knife or a gun, your whole career is over okay. with. Okay. Your, your, your whole career is over with. Um, so yeah, so that that's definitely you, you definitely touched on everything that we needed to talk about, and um, definitely I, I appreciate the, the the quick interview, but it was great, it was informative, and we definitely appreciate it. Uh, thank you for Coach Bill Williams for sitting down with me today. We appreciate it. Thank you. No problem. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Hello, beautiful people. My name is Celeste, and I'm a therapist. Uh, I actually go by Celeste, the therapist, and I'm a therapist in Boston. And I just kind of wanted to talk about mental health and how it plays a role in our lives. Uh, mental health literally controls everything that we do. Uh, when we're not okay up here um, in our head, um, a lot of times that transfers in our decision making, our professional life, our family life, um, our physical health. And a lot of times people don't even realize it. 
I'm a therapist, right? And I remember when I was 19 years old, I was dealing with the stressful event of trying to get money back from this car company. And uh, what happened was uh, I ended up in the hospital because my oxygen level dropped. So I'm like, I'm sick. I know these people are going to tell me I got something because I'm sick. And so the next day they did all these tests and they came back and they said to me, your test came back normal. And I'm like, well, something's wrong. Uh, and they said, have you thought about seeing a therapist? Like, are you going through any stressful events? I just told y'all I was stressed, but at, at 19 years old, I was, a, I was an adult. I did not make the connection um, that the struggles I was having in my personal life was affecting my physical health. And the reason why I tell that story, I tell that story to people because right now I'm so vocal about mental health. I'm so vocal about the stigma that exists. I know sometimes people think that I was born this way. People think that I've always had this mindset around my mental health, but I didn't have this mindset all the time. When they told me that I should see a therapist, I was highly offended and I ripped my IVs out of my arm and I left the hospital. And and now, you know, 2019 today, like I'm a therapist and um, I really want you to understand that whatever you were told growing up, pray about it or, you know, um, things will change. Just think it into existence. Understand that if you um, was having a heart attack, no one would say just just think the heart is going to get better. Or no one would say just pray uh, that this heart attack goes away. People will call nine one one, right? So what makes your mental health different from your physical health? There's there's really no difference. The only difference that I notice is that we don't pay attention to it. So I would challenge you, you know, to start paying attention to your mental health, start paying attention to your thoughts, pay attention to the things that are, are affecting you in life, right? A lot of times we are so used to just keep going and we don't take time off to pause and understand like what's going on in our lives. Um, so definitely start working on your mental health because you matter. And uh, the only way change is going to happen when it comes to your mental health is if you start to take control over it. Um, so, thank you guys. Greetings, family. My name is Harrell Mitchell. I am a state certified mental health professional. I've been working in mental health for 10 plus years. I work with juvenile sex offenders. I work with clients that were not guilty by reason of insanity. I worked in Eastern State Hospital. I worked at two community service boards, and I worked at two regional jails providing mental health services to individuals that are incarcerated that have mental health issues. I have did a lot of research on mental health and the statistics. Uh, one of the recent statistics show that 43.6 million Americans suffer with mental illness and about 7.9 deal with mental illness as well as substance abuse. It is a growing thing going on in America right now. People dealing with mental health issues and not knowing what to do when these issues arise. One of the main things and one of the biggest advice I can give to individuals that are suffering with mental illness is to reach out, seek someone in your community, someone in your church, someone that you can talk to that you trust and get professional mental health help from. Um, one of the most recent things that I've learned that a lot of mental illness come from trauma, dealing with things that happened to you in your past. Anything that happened before today is considered your past. So something you might have dealt with last week that was very traumatic to you, that can cause mental health issues. I encourage you to reach out. There's people out here that really care and people out here that really want to pro provide support and help. Don't ever sit around and feel like no one is not there for you. Don't ever sit around and feel like you have no one to go to because you do. Um, this documentary is for a guy I met by the name of Eric Hunter. He was a famous football player. I was then downtown Newport News on 19th Street doing mental health work and I met Eric. We generally started talking about football and then I asked him, how did he get to this point? Eric provided to me information that was, um, you know, it was personal to him and he provided it to me. He let me know that he was accused of something that happened in college that he didn't do. And he said, this is the reason he lost it. He pretty much said he lost it. And, um, you know, I told Eric that, well, right now he looks good. He's in a good state and to continue to doing what he's doing to rehabilitate himself. Um, he was a very nice young man, and I remember hearing his name briefly when I was young regarding football in the Hampton Rose area. He was a tremendous athlete in high school and in college.
but something happened and it set Eric off and he was to the point where he was. And um, he was a very nice young man, very likable, nice attitude, very friendly. And um, Eric was a person who did have mental health issues, but um, he, was, he was in a very good state and unfortunately things happened that um, I'm pretty sure that we all have heard about and it was, um, it was a pretty sad event. But um, Eric, was a, he, he, he was a really good young man, and I worked with him just to encourage him, to help him to continue to stay on the right path. But um, it just didn't turn out that way. Um, just thank you for all your support that people have provided to Eric. And if you do need help regarding mental health issues, don't forget, you can reach out. There's people out here that will help. There's community resources. There's people all over that will provide assistance to you if you are suffering with some type of mental health or substance abuse issues. Thank you, God bless you, and have a great day. Hello, everyone. Uh, 757, originally 804, the Peninsula District, the PD. Uh, this is Todd Kelly, um, originally from Hampton, Virginia. Uh, graduated from Bethel High School, went there from 85 to 89, went on to uh, get a, a student athletic scholarship at the University of Tennessee from 89 to 92, and then played in the NFL. Uh, was drafted in the first round by the San Francisco 49ers, uh, 27th pick. Uh, actually played in the NFL from 93 to 97. Um, it is my pleasure to talk about Eric Hunter, um, you know, Rick Hunter, is the one I know though. I, I, I go and take him by Rick um, because that's who he was. He was Rick Hunter, number nine for the crab. And Rick was one of the most fierce competitors I've ever seen to come through the Peninsula District. You know, before there was a, a Allen Iverson, before there was a Ronald Curry, um, you know, there was a, a Rick Hunter. And actually, uh, Derrick Croom, who was also a legend over at the crab, he was a starter uh, my first couple years in high school. And then, you know, he graduated in 87. And, and Rick took over. After he graduated, and Rick took over in a fierce, uh, fierce role. He was very competitive. He would jump in people's face. He would, he would really try to dominate the whole game. There was one time there was an article where he was uh, throwing a football, and I saw his, a picture in the newspaper. You can actually see his thumbprint in the football, so it lets you know how tight of a grip he had and how strong of an arm he had. And he would actually throw 65, 70 yard bombs uh, to Tony Hyman, and you know every Friday or Saturday. But what was awesome about Rick is, you know, some highlights about him is me and him were roommates uh, at the Virginia All-Star game, East-West All-Star game, and he hit me on the first pass uh, uh, from scrimmage when I was playing tight end, the very first play, and he almost put a hole in my chest. Um, he also uh, was my roommate as well when we played in the Senior Bowl, uh, with top players in 1993 all over the country. Um, Rick wasn't even the starter in the senior bowl in Mobile, Alabama. He was the backup, and he won MVP. He was actually the MVP for the senior bowl and won a trip to the Caribbean. And then I know he went back to um, to Purdue, and that's when things started to get dark. I don't know all the details about what happened with Rick, but I know he was never the same. And uh, Rick Hunter, if, if anybody uh, doesn't know, and you're watching this video, I'm going to let you know is that he was one of the fierce competitors ever come to the PD. And if you didn't know Rick Hunter, he was the next Randall Cunningham. If you Google Randall Cunningham and look at his highlights, that was Rick Hunter. Rest in peace, number nine. Yo, we asked for the I mic. had the opportunity to sit down with Eric's cousin yeah, Quan, Mike, his sister Mike, Yvonne, Mike, and Felicia. Like, no, I, I Quan talks Mike. about how confident so Eric was like, going into the All Star game. And looked at all, all the quarterbacks was there, right? He's like, look, y'all just need to go ahead and give me that now. And everybody was looking at him like, who is you? What, what's wrong with you? And in history itself, he's like, y'all need to give me that now because I'm going to go ahead and win it. And they was looking at him like, who is this cocky dude right here? He was like, we quan. He said, you know I'm going to win it, right? I said, yeah, you're going to get it. He said, yeah, because you're going with me. So we end up, he ended up winning it, MVP. And we went we went to the bar, I mean, to uh, Virgin, Virgin Island. Island. That's cool. Hampton High School was the uh, place where most of these quarterbacks went to and you had a person who I thought could have been and should have been in the Purdue cradle of quarterbacks. And to this day, I still say that I don't know what it's going to take on my part 
to impress the selection committee at Purdue University that Eric Hunter should be in the credit quarterback. Now, everybody would tell me, well, Leroy, you never saw Eric play, which is true. But to hear his teammate, guys he played with back in 89, 90, 91, when he was a freshman coming out of Hampton, that Eric Hunter was the real deal. No, make no uh, mistake about it, this kid had athletic ability, he was big, he had a strong arm, he had footwork, he had tangibles that a lot of the quarterbacks at Purdue today didn't have and will never have. But yet, he's excluded from this cradle of quarterbacks. And I used to always want to know, why? Well, was it because the coaches didn't understand how gifted this kid was? Six games as a freshman, and he is qualified as the Big Ten Freshman of the Year. You don't become Big Ten Freshman of the Year quarterback if you don't have skills. Eric Hunter had skills. Where are you from? I don't think that should have made a difference because he did the job on the field of action. And I said, I, I really didn't need to see him play. Uh, I knew how he played. I saw it in the faces, I saw it in the voices and the mannerism of his teammates. Eric Hunter was truly one of the best quarterbacks to come through Purdue University for the short period of time that he was a quarterback. He had skills that no one could take away except a head coach. And quite obviously, he was recruited by Fred Akers who made the wishbone famous with Earl Campbell down at the University of Texas. And when he came to Purdue University, I guess they felt like, well, we'll work wishbone, which Eric made very successful. Uh, but the new coach coming in, Jim Coletto, decided we're going to disband the wishbone and go to a, a T formation, power formation. And he said, Eric Hunter just don't fit my descriptive of what I want a quarterback. But I'm, I'm saying 6'4", over 200 pounds, some kind of cannon for an arm. Just as quick, can change direction. Uh, the first coming of not even Doug Williams, but Eldred Dickey and some of the other great quarterbacks who who were African Americans coming through at that time. But here's a kid who could get the job done and prove that he could get it done. And this coach decided, I can't use, utilize you in my scheme. And I think that began the downslide of Purdue football on a winning scale. Because here's a kid who's winning and now you got a coach telling him I can't use you. And you're sitting there going like, right, is this real? You can't use Eric Hunter? Purdue could have gone undefeated <laughs> several times or at least by for the Big Ten Championship with Eric Hunter at quarterback, but this coach made this decision. And since that time, Purdue has had African-American quarterbacks in voice, but they've only played two in the last 25 years. What about you, Ms. Siobhan? Um, what was your initial reaction when you heard about your brother's passing? I was in shock because um, I just didn't hope, I didn't want that to happen to my brother, but I deal with it one day at a time. And I know that one day I'll see my brother again. Definitely. So I think about it every single day. I think about my brother every day. Yeah. What about you, Lowe? What was your initial? Well, my initial reaction, my phone rang. Facebook went off. Phone rang. And I'm like, gosh, oh my, somebody called me this time of the night, something bad happened. So her friend had called me on Facebook and told me. And then Mark had called and told me. And I'm like, wow. So and when they hit you, you know, you sleep, and you like, can't believe it. You know, your your brain jumps up, but your body's still sitting there like, hold on, I can't move yet. You know, you have to try to move and your body to still numb. And it, it, it was scary. I can honestly say it was scary. Because you, you go through, the, you know, first thing you want to, okay, you, you upset, then you get angry. Then you want to seek revenge, and 
you don't know who did it. So you you just wow, you know, it just you, then you come around to see the sisters and they wow, really they they lost the only male figure in their family. I mean, I mean, you feel their pain, then you sitting like, damn, how this really gonna happen? You know, so you just try to just absorb all of the pain and just push it back out. Okay. Now, in um, and so and in closing. In closing, what do you want society and whoever views this documentary, what do you want them to learn from the passing of Eric? And all you guys can answer okay. the question. First thing, um, incarceration never helps at all. If somebody has a mental illness, jail is the last place they should be. Um, and medicine is really a secondary thing. Instead of locking them up, treat them. Ask them what the problems are they go through every day. Don't just say, okay, this guy's a thug and we're gonna lock him up. Because you see now all these people are dying in jail. Jail is not meant for everybody. You know, once you're in that little six by nine cell, your brain go through a million things. The first thing you wanna do is get out of there. Then you think about, okay, somebody mess with me, I'm gonna stay here forever because I'm end up hurting them, I'm end up killing them. Therefore, you're gonna lose all your freedom. So basically, when you lock somebody up with a mental illness, you should have somebody in there to talk to them and not put them in a cell. Treat them as a comfortable person so their mind can be at ease. Because when your mind is angry, you become an angry person. As soon as you get out, your mind just shuts down because you don't know what reaction is going to tick you off anymore. you got a lot of triggers that's going to happen and people say wrong word to you. Somebody say, how you doing? You might not be expected. This person might want something from you. You know, so you got to balance your life back out because of your mental illness. And they want to drug you up so you walk around looking like a zombie. So it, it won't work. You, the best way for, for, the, for the cure I look at it is talking to someone. Go to a psychiatrist. If you're going to lock me up, at least have me in a comfortable room, not in a cell. That way you can come in there and talk to me each day for my 45 minutes and feed me and give me the right things to get my mind cured along with my body cured. Because that's a combination. You said while in jail, assault of those things. I, be, I believe if all of that was going on in jail, he probably had a would had you know a better. Um, it probably would have turned out better for him because you know, <clears throat> I don't think he had a psychiatrist in jail. Nobody to talk to. They just gave him his meds and sent him on on his on his way. I mean, they even did that when he was out. That's all you know when he did go to take his meds, which he only went once a month, and just sitting there talking to a psychiatrist. He just asked him a bunch of questions, and that was pretty much it. And take a urine test. If that didn't come out right, it, you know, the doctor go on about his business. So, so, so it was really safe to say that the, overall the system and it somewhat failed Eric, and not just Eric, but and just in general, when they we misplace people and put them in prison when they really need to be in, in maybe some a, other type of yeah. help other than jail. Yeah. Now, do y'all think this is, is 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 more systematic with black individuals, African Americans, or is it everyone? I tend to believe it, it has a lot to do with African Americans in general. Well. Before you lock people up, it can be solved in a simple way. If you're going to pull the background, pull the entire background and see if these people have a mental illness. It's only 45 seconds long. Wait to the response to come before you put them in mass incarceration. Because once you put them into the system, now his mind go from being, I want to be safe to then, I want to defend myself. You can't do both if you want to treat yourself. Because as soon as you get angry, oh, this guy, oh, he's, he came from a bad background of life. He's just, we're going to keep him in here. Don't know why. You just want to lock him up and throw away the key. What are you going to get out of this? And then you want him to come out of the system. You didn't reform it. You didn't teach nobody anything. You didn't give him anything to come out here and make themselves a better person. But yet you want to push him back out the door of society with a felony and then say, get a job. Now, who's going to hire you? But yet you see all these people that's going to jail, got felonies, and you look at them on TV. Now, what is the difference between them and other people? They found some people that's going to believe in them. They found a system that's willing to help them. Whereas if you don't have anything, 
you can't get yourself out there to speak on it, so therefore nobody's going to talk about it. You know, Meek Mills is trying to bring all this up to light as well. You know, but it's not going to work. Black people get locked up for spitting in the street. Now you got white folks walking around with a camera. You can't cook out here. You can't have a party here. You can't freak your tire up here. You can't go in the store here. You can't eat here. You can't speak Spanish here. Come on, man. What do we have in society that's willing to help us? We came here along with damn white people way back when. Why? Why the, the first president and the 45th president are on the same way path? What happened? What happened to the world between 1776 and 2018? that nobody sees that we want to grow as people, but you think you're better than us. Definitely. Now, what would you say, what would you want people to get out of this documentary, Ms. Siobhan? What, what do you want the world to see? Well, if your child is playing football and they have a concussion, you should really get it checked out. And I believe he should have had some kind of, uh, you know, some kind of, uh, I just don't think the doctors here, they never looked into anything like that. They, When Rick came home, it wasn't nothing but medicine, no no CAT scans, MRIs, or anything to check and see if, if the mental part was from, stemmed from something else, or where did it, where did all of this just come from? So I, I believe that if that could have happened, maybe we would know really what to call what we have now, what it, whatever it is, we'll know what it, you know, what to call it. Besides CTE, but also one, one that day, but back in the day, there wasn't no thing called concussion. Right. They break the stick, put it up on your nose, you get back in, or you sit on the bench. Now, if you stay on the sideline, somebody going in, they got your spot. Then now you got to wait the practice to come up the, the, to get right. your spot back. Seeing it was one game, he he had. Got a, he got hit real hard and he was out for about a minute. And I say that could have been um, yeah, the he concussion. Said he, didn't know where he was at. Yeah. He said that in the newspaper. And I just felt like, well, if that happened, did they take him to the hospital after the game? Or did he have that checked out? You know, but no. And even, even when he came home, even getting into trouble, nobody really did anything. I think they looked at Rick more like a celebrity and just don't do that no more. And next month or so, he'll do it again. So then they ain't have no choice but to lock him up. He get 18 months or so, something like that and come home and do the you know, same thing. Most of Rick charges, I guess, would be like trespass. Just trespass it, being somewhere that he know he, you know, and he just don't go do it, don't go over there no more. He go right back, go do the same thing over and, and over. I just think a lot of that could have been avoided. Maybe I just feel like if, you know, his psychiatrist or his therapist might have checked into it a little bit more. Let me see what's going on inside your your head, never. just to see. Knowing that he played football, or you know, we could have a different, a different outlook on it. Maybe they would have knew how to treat whatever it was that he had, except for giving him. Um, he has to slow him down. Yeah, you know, I think he was taking like five dollars or something. Can't think of it. Oh no, they can't give you an excuse. Okay, our caseloads are so full. Okay, have a group session. Just like you're doing AA and NA. You can get 12 to 25 people in one circle and have them all vent. What's the problem with you? You're not going away, but you're going to see them all. You can sit down for two hours and talk to each person. So you think that Eric, the medication that Eric was on, he didn't really need medication. He just more so needed the package deal, meaning he needed everything and not just medication. He needed everything. He needed the... He needed someone to talk to. He 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 needed his medicine because I think he was hearing voices. But I know it could be times that he may go like two months without his medicine, and he'd be like, "Sis, I need to go take my medicine. I need it. I'm starting to, you know, hear things and stuff like that." So whenever I got the opportunity, I would 
take him to go get to his uh, doctor, you know. The syrup wheel, that was it. That was no. the one of those syrup wheels? Because he was taking medicine for anxiety. He was taking, well, I know one time the doctor had put him on medicine for depression. And she gave him, like, chores to do. Uh, like, take out the trash, clean your room, things he had to do every every day just to get him to, you know, try to lift himself up. And, um, but that didn't last. Same way I did. Here we go with uh, Here's Eric, Eric Hunter with the winning quarterback, Eric Hunter. All right, uh, Eric, uh, your thoughts? Big win for the Crabbers today. Yeah, it was a very, very big win for us today. You know, we ain't never beat them since um, our JV year, and so we came out here real psyched up, and we did it. A little different than last year. Yeah, a lot different. What about this team? How far can it go, Eric? I think we can go state, but we still got to work harder.
Well, there you have it. Number nine, the Eric Hunter documentary. Hope you all enjoyed it. Hope you all learned something. Eric Hunter, number nine, may you rest in peace.